Hello Internet, Seth Skorikowski, and today I want to review the classic Call of Cthulhu scenario, Bad Moon Rising. Written by Marcus L. Rowland, the adventure appears in the 1989 collection The Great Old Ones, published by Chaosium. Coming in at 39 pages, the scenario should take at least two sessions. Keepers might want to prepare for three, just in case. The adventure is set in England during the late 1920s. Characters can either be British or just simply visiting from another country, but either way, they need to be experienced investigators who have had several dealings with the mythos before. It offers the investigations an elaborate plot, a secret cover-up, some lesser-used mythos creatures, fantastic role-playing opportunities, and is also extremely light on combat. It also offers one of the best plot twists that I have ever seen and will leave your players talking about it for years. However, while Bad Moon Rising has a lot to offer, it is not a great adventure. It's definitely memorable and an extremely unique, but there are some definite flaws that hold it back. So I'm going to offer my criticisms and suggestions as a game master who has successfully run this adventure. Hey, and I'm Jack, the NPC. I'm going to lay this one out from a player's point of view, because trust me, I got some opinions on this one. Now players, before we go any further, from here on forward, I'm going to be laying out the spoilers. So if you ever want to play this adventure, you should stop here, otherwise you're going to ruin it for yourself. Alrighty keepers, let's get started. Bad Moon Rising is a great story. Unfortunately, it focuses so much on the story that's already written, that it can forget to let the players make it their own story. We start with the PCs attending a presentation at the legendary Diogenes Club, which you might recall from Sherlock Holmes. The players will witness an experiment by the famous Professor Moe, who through hypnotism will show his audience a glimpse of the distant future of 1987. The experiment goes awry, and Moe's subject instead glimpses the near future involving artifacts older than time and some sort of upcoming tragedy. The audience is very unimpressed with this performance, and Mo will then ask the PCs for help. Some days later, an article in the London Times will tell of a diving accident off the Lancashire coast that involves the names that were mentioned in Mo's prediction. Mo will telegram the PCs, imploring them to head out to Barrow and Furnace to check this out. Oh, yeah, sure, I can totally do this. Uh, what, what is it we're doing? I'm not totally clear on that. Once the PCs arrive, they can do a little research into the recent accident. The module provides some good information, but it's not organized in a useful manner, so keepers might want to put bullet points on what information the PCs can discover and what roles that they need to use to discover it. The most useful information is what they'll learn at the formal inquest for the dead sailors. A few psychology roles will reveal some discrepancies in the Royal Navy's official story of what happened. They'll also get to meet the grieving widow of one of the sailors, and she can tell the PCs how her husband was not a novice diver, like the Navy said, and how he was on some sort of secret mission he was stationed aboard the HMS Selene. Ma'am, I am so sorry for your loss, and I can promise you that we will do everything in our power to... <sighs> Why is it we're here again? Because I'm still not entirely sure on that. What follows is an elaborate plot where the PCs will uncover a government conspiracy. However, there is zero sense of urgency or direction given to the PCs, almost as if they're just supposed to care about the adventure because the players know that this is the adventure. So while yes, the plot is interesting, it's also clumsy, and the players will become understandably frustrated with it. My suggestion is to have some new messages or orders coming from Professor Mo after they get there. Maybe after the inquest, there could be another telegram or something sent to him that Mo has had a second premonition, and it says that there is a huge disaster still imminent. Maybe you can tell them that the Selene will be lost, and that one of the voices from the future just kept repeating, had, had they only known how to operate this alien, ancient technology, that maybe 15 brave men wouldn't have died. This would give the PCs a reason to care. If they believe that they can stop even more deaths, and if they know that it is actually linked to the Selene, and it's linked to alien technology, most likely mythos-related, which they should have experience with, 
that might encourage them to investigate further. The adventure does give several options as to how the investigation can go from here. James will need to be pretty familiar with the material as the PCs are going to be going up and down the coast following different leads. Don't be afraid to throw them a bone every now and then just to keep the game going. Have them stop at a bar where they're going to see the memorial for the mine collapse that happened a year before and they can see the photographs of the naval divers that went down into the mine. Maybe they can see some you know, naval trucks going up and down the road and underneath the tarps they can see HMS Selene stenciled across some of the boxes and that can start pointing them in the right direction or kind of encourage them that yes, the Selene is somewhere near here. As the characters kind of work their way around and they start asking questions, the Navy will hear about it. Because of the top secret nature of what this mission is, and especially if the PCs are foreign, you know, if they're American and asking these questions, the Navy is really going to take some notice in that. They're then going to take a couple days to investigate the PCs, kind of figure them out, and then they're going to arrest them as possible spies. Keep this as a solid backup, just in case the players find themselves up against a wall in ideas or they start getting frustrated, that's when you can go ahead and arrest them. So keep the investigation going only as long as the players find it fun and interesting, but keep this as your ace in a hole just to wrap it up before they get too frustrated and stop having fun. One idea that the module really seems to dwell on is the notion that once we discover the top secret Navy base that's operating out of the abandoned mine is that we would storm it. This is a military installation with armed guards that are patrolling it. Why would we even do that? Because the module gave us zero sense of urgency, we had no reason to think that the Navy might be up to no good or need our help, and definitely no reason at all to storm it. But the module spends a significant amount of time dwelling on the notion that this is what a player would naturally do, and it makes zero sense. Whether it happens while they're storming a secret naval base, or while they're just quietly sitting in a hotel trying to figure out where to move next, the PCs are going to be arrested. Once they're in the Navy's custody, they're going to be interrogated. At this point, the PCs will need to explain why they're snooping, and they're going to need to demonstrate that they have some sort of experience and understanding of the mythos. Roleplay this part up. Have them recount their adventures and tell them everything that they know. Have fun with this. There's a mysterious Mr. K who grills them on their adventures. And you can go ahead and start breaking down any lies that they're telling trying to cover themselves. Remember, the entire point of this interrogation is for the PCs to just literally explain, oh, we've dealt with this before, and we know so much more than you guys, and have them actually tell stories that they would never, ever consider telling another living human being before. The one that really grabbed their interest was when we told them about the Lost Expedition. You know, the one where we went through a gate that led to another world that had a pyramid that was covered in alien writing that we had to decipher in order to get home? It was about that point that Kay was all like, okay, stop talking, you're hired. Go ahead and sign these 800 non-disclosure forms and we got a story to tell you. Once the Royal Navy decides that the PCs are trustworthy, they're going to tell them how last year there was a mine collapse and the mine flooded, and the Navy sent some divers down there to recover the bodies. But while they were down there, they discovered a strange ring that was covered in alien hieroglyphs and older than all of human civilization. The ring was a gate, and the gate led them to a cave that was filled with strange pyramids. The Royal Navy will ask the PCs for help in understanding these hieroglyphs and understanding what these pyramids are. The PCs are then outfitted with highly experimental diving suits that have six hours worth of air and don't require an airline going to them, so they're pretty cool. There's kind of a, a, a weird science sort of pulpy feel to it, which I really liked. Oh yeah, and those of us with uh, claustrophobia, bathophobia, or scothophobia are gonna really hate this pot. Once the PCs go down into the mine and they step through the gates, they will be transported into an enormous cavern filled with 30 giant pyramids. It's also at this moment that they're going to discover that the diving suits aren't diving suits at all, but they're actually spacesuits, because the PCs are now standing on the surface of the moon. Holy crap! I did not see this one coming. 
This reveal was when I ended the first session, and it was one hell of a great ending. I highly recommend that keepers try to time their session so they can end the first game on that same sort of plot twist reveal and cliffhanger end, because that's when your players are going to go, oh my god, when can we get back to this adventure? Now, the next part of the adventure begins with the characters performing several different tasks on the moon. There's a whole lot that they can do, and there's a whole lot that they can explore, and there's a lot of different skills that can be employed that, that you know, kind of tap into what your player's uh, actual you know, preferences are. You know, do they have good mechanical repair? Do they have good map-making skills? Are they really into physics and science and all those? All of those will be useful in some way or another, but especially mythos. Now, one problem is that the map of the Pyramid Cave is incorrectly marked with several numbers repeating. With a little Photoshop, I fixed the numbers, so keepers at least be aware that the map has this problem. Eventually, the PCs or someone will decipher the strange writing that's written on some of the pyramids, and they will notice that one of the glyphs is different. Now, it only describes this glyph as being oval. So what I recommend is that when your players inevitably ask what this glyph looks like and how is the shape different for the glyph that's on Pyramid 27, that you describe the different looking glyph as being egg-shaped. The reason is later on, when they find that same symbol again, you'll need to then describe it as being upside down. So when I ran it, I just called it an oval. And that caused a lot of mental angst for my players when later on, when we came across that symbol upside down, I'm like, uh, yeah, it's uh, the same symbol, but it's upside down. And they couldn't quite grasp what I was talking about. So, learn from my mistake. Have the original symbol be an oval, the different one that's on Pyramid 27 be an ovoid. And then later on, when they come across that symbol again, it's an inverted ovoid. Once they crack the mystery, the pyramid will open and the PCs will enter a strange and fantastical mystery inside. It's at that time that I had the Navy open up their secret cache of weapons, so the PCs went down with four armed Marines and Commander Niles. The rest of the Navy and the Marines stayed stopside with the remaining weapons. Niles should be extremely reluctant just to give his guns to the PCs, because there aren't that many to begin with, and the PCs are still technically civilians. What do you mean I can't have a gun? I demand at least two pistols, one rifle, and an entire box of dynamite. You guys brought me along because I have mythos experience, and my mythos experience tells me that all y'all chumps are gonna die. So let's just go ahead and give me all the guns now, Otherwise, I'm going to be picking up out of your cold, dead hands in a few minutes. Just saying. Inside the pyramid should feel alien and weird, everything being built on a much larger scale than human understanding. The module compares this to Krell City from Forbidden Planet, and that is a great description. This was also when I turned on the Forbidden Planet soundtrack to play for my players as they went underneath the pyramid. Oh yeah, because theremin music, that requires a sanity roll just to endure it. Eventually, as the players are exploring, they will accidentally awaken the great race of Yith who are hibernating here. It's a dramatic moment when the great race awakens and they make their appearance and confront these kind of human interlopers that they suddenly find there. There is no way for the PCs to win this fight, so eventually the PCs are going to be captured or killed. Hopefully, you can capture them. I used a few of my Marines as examples as what not to do when the Marines attack the Great Race. And the PCs were like, whoa, yeah, we're just going to set down our weapons because fighting, this ain't going to work. Now, what follows after they're captured is mostly out of the player's control. The PCs will be thrown into sort of a suspended animation, and they're going to come out millions of years later, long after humanity is extinct. From there, they're going to be sent back to Earth and housed in a strange laboratory where they're going to be studied and watched by the Yith, who are now exist as colonies of bugs, where they're going to be interviewed and experimented upon. This part can be very fun and interesting, but there isn't much that the PCs can actually control. They just kind of have to go along with it as the GM tells them what's going on. One suggestion that I have is to add a clue inside the house Maybe a name that's scratched into the bottom of the wooden plates that has the date 1915 written beside it. That'll work as sort of a subtle foreshadowing of what the Great Race's ultimate plan with the PCs is. 
After some time, the PCs will be dragged to an underground laboratory where gruesome experiments will be performed on them. They'll meet a bug colony here that claims that it's really a human that's going through one of the great race's mind transfers, and he's really from 1915, and he'll offer to help the PCs escape. Somewhere in here, the Yithians are going to swap bodies with one of the player characters. This can be tricky since you as the Keeper will need to pull that player aside and tell them how to play as a Yithian. However, it's not going to be that difficult for them to do since there's not much anything else that the players are going to be able to control. The PCs will break out of their cell and with the aid of their new friend will enter a strange machine. Once they're inside the time machine, it activates and starts moving them through time. This part of the adventure is pretty neat as they're watching billions of years passing by outside their window. It's pretty much just two pages of description as the characters are watching the death and the rebirth of the universe. While cool, once again the players have no control and are just listening to a story of what they see. Eventually the time machine will slow to a stop, and it's at this point that keepers can decide where and when they are. Is this the same world that they left? Maybe the year is off and now it's you know, Cthulhu by Gaslight, or maybe it's Cthulhu Modern. Maybe everything is very different, or maybe it's just a little different. Like, maybe they're all lizard people, or maybe it's more like the end of Planet of the Apes or something. This makes the adventure a great moment to reboot, reset, or actually just end the campaign. For my own game, I had the players arrive and they discovered that a beloved friend, a PC who had died several adventures before, was now still alive and completely normal in this universe. And one of the PCs arrived to discover that it was actually their character that had died in that other character's place. So it's kind of a wonderful little moment where they got to meet an old friend that they thought was dead. But then they all had to make sanity checks because they were all looking at somebody that they knew for a fact had died but clearly hadn't. Whatever you choose as the Game Master is up to you. But it is a wonderful opportunity for you to do just about anything you want. Overall... I found Bad Moon Rising to be a highly imaginative and unique adventure. I love the concept of it. However, the execution of it is a bit bland. The first portion is a great investigation, but the player's motivation is shaky at best. And then large portions, especially the final third of it, are just completely out of the player's control, and it's just them listening to the Keeper tell them a story as they occasionally roll sanity checks over what they're seeing. However, the story itself and the opportunity for a keeper to just hit a big reset button on the campaign is kind of nice about it. So while I wouldn't recommend this to just anyone, keepers that want to try out a very unique and very memorable adventure uh, with sort of a Stargate feel might want to check this out. What do you mean Stargate feel? It is totally Stargate. A little, but it's not totally Stargate. Oh really? Well let me count the ways for you. A story opens in the late 1920s. Then our heroes begin at a haughty academic presentation that everyone scoffs at. Then they get recruited by the military who are operating out of a secret underground complex where they have a ring-shaped gate made out of an unidentified material covered in alien hieroglyphics. Oh, and the surface of said gate looks like a shifting mirror. The military needs them to decipher this alien writing. Oh, and once they go through the gate, they find themselves at a pyramid, and not just any pyramid, one created by an advanced alien species who can steal the bodies of humans and plug its mind into them. Holy crap, it is totally Stargate. Yup, because this adventure was published in 1989, and Stargate didn't come out till 1994, I sure hope somebody got their royalties for it. Anyway... While no longer available to print, you can find the Great Old Ones as a PDF on DriveThruRPG. There are five other adventures that are in here, so even if Bad Moon Rising doesn't sound like your kind of adventure, the book is definitely worth checking out. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that little thumbs up down there, or maybe even share it. If you want to see some more of our reviews or videos, just hit that little subscribe button. Until next time, heroes, you have yourselves a great day. You know, I really want to watch Stargate now, like, bad.